Hi folks, welcome to our weekly update for English 560. Uh, we're coming up on week 11 of our Shakespeare semester, and this week we're focused almost exclusively on King Lear. The quiz over Acts 3 through 5 will be due on Monday the 7th of November. I do want to make a quick schedule change, however, uh, on the teaching Shakespeare essay assignment that is due originally due on Monday the 14th. I want to shift that back to Monday the 21st. I'm going to be out of town for the week of the 14th. I'll be uh, doing some administrative work in China, so it'll be kind of tough for me to get your essays and review them that week. If you want to hand them in early, that's terrific. I will take them, uh, but I will at this point ask them to be re turned in to me on Monday the 21st and I'll make sure that's clear on the announcements page of the website as well. Uh, I hope you're enjoying King Lear. We haven't had a chance to talk about it yet as of the filming of this message. Uh, I will confess, King Lear is one of my favorite, if not my absolute favorite, of all of Shakespeare's plays, which means it's my favorite of all plays. Uh, it is aggravating, it is frustrating. There are times you just want to jump up on stage and shake these characters. Uh, but if it's done well, if it's performed successfully, it just rips your heart out. And uh, it's a play that I come back to again and again and again uh, with some trepidation and with uh, real enthusiasm. A couple of stage setting pieces that I want to put in front of you just as you're digging your way through the play. Uh, remember that in 1603, Queen Elizabeth dies and James VI of Scotland becomes King of England as well. The two countries were not joined politically, but there was certainly that sense of uh, completion for the island. Uh, think about that as you were reading the first scene or rereading the first scene of King Lear, where Lear is talking about cutting up his kingdom. Very different move, very different set of fears. <coughs> also, it's worth remembering that with James's ascension to the throne, the control over Shakespeare's playing company shifts away from the Lord Chamberlain's men. It became illegal for anyone outside of the royal family to maintain or control a playing company. So Shakespeare's group became the King's men, and that's going to have some implications down the line, I think. Uh, one other historical note about this play. Shakespeare, of course, is borrowing from histories and legends. It was a very uh, familiar story. Uh, if you've read Spencer's The Fairy Queen, you'll have encountered at least a brief reference to the history or the legend of King Lear and his three daughters. In all of those earlier stories, however, Lear survives. The, the Lear ends his life back restored to the throne, uh, lives out the rest of his uh, days, and dies peacefully, and then there's a following civil war after Cordelia, or the Cordelia character, ascends to the throne. Uh, spoiler alert, Shakespeare changes that, and as you're looking at the way the ending of the play functions, keep in mind that Shakespeare's original audience almost certainly expected a very different ending. Uh, I'll be interested in seeing your reaction to that. The play has been praised for the elegance of its dual plot, and you might be thinking about the way the story of Gloucester and his sons illuminates, <coughs> excuse me, illuminates or reflects the story of Lear and his daughters. Where do you see the similarities? Where do you see differences? Uh, maybe one other thing to be thinking about, I raised the topic of the tragic hero in our discussion of Othello, and obviously that's germane in this play as well. Do you feel that Lear fulfills your expectations of what a tragic hero might be? That's probably enough by way of me babbling about this play. Uh, I hope you enjoy it, but I hope it's a painful and, and uh, difficult experience too. Uh, good tragedy really should be. I look forward to seeing what you want to talk about on the discussion boards.